In this recording, we want to delve into DNA structure with greater detail. So again, DNA it really embodies one of the themes in biology, that being form and function. And by understanding its structure, we can understand much better how it works. Okay, again, DNA is deoxyribonucleic acid. We most often see it in its double helix form though it technically is two single-stranded molecules that are held together by a series of hydrogen bonds. Those hydrogen bonds be lie between the nitrogenous bases of the nucleotides, uh, those nitrogenous bases being purines and pyrimidines, and that is the source of the A's and the G's, adenine and guanine, and the T's, the C's, and the U's that we often see associated with the sequence of DNA, because that is the sequence that contains information in DNA. And we're going to hear these again and again and again as we try to learn more about the structure of DNA and then use DNA um, in biology. So again, DNA is composed of nucleotides. The monomer that is the polymer that DNA, the monomers are the nucleotides. And each nucleotide has a nitrogenous base, five carbon sugar, and a phosphate group. And I need you to understand that basic structure kind of here as we outline it in the nucleotide box but I also need you to be able to know each of the carbons numbered 1 through 5. So you need to study that so that you can reproduce that um, at will from memory. Now the phosphate group enables us to create what's called a phosphodiester backbone and you'll learn more about ester bonds when you take organic chemistry but know that this gives us a region um, of highly negative charge um, on the molecule and that plays a role when you deal with uh, DNA in the lab. But the other thing that's interesting about the phosphodiester backbone and the way the riboses are attached to each other, or deoxyriboses are attached to each other, is that it gives directionality to the molecule. And we call that directionality 3 prime to 5 prime, or 5 prime to 3 prime. And that 5 and 3 come from the numbers on the carbon atoms on the sugar. So again, if you notice at the bottom of this slide, you see 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 for the DNA and the RNA. And technically, if you showed the whole nucleotide, that would be um, labeled prime. So it will be 1 prime, 2 prime, 3 prime, 4 prime, 5 prime carbons to distinguish them from the carbons that we see in the nitrogenous bases. But that is also then the 5 prime and 3 prime, the source of where we get the orientation to the molecule. Each nucleotide has a 5 prime end and a 3 prime end, that 3 prime end being attached to a hydroxyl group, which is going to be important in the linkage of the next nucleotide when we start to build more DNA. But then that lends itself to an orientation in the polymer itself, which one end is a 5 prime and one end is a 3 prime. All right? Now Watson and Crick <clears throat> were the ones to deduce the structure of DNA and as I noticed, as I mentioned before rather, that um, when you understand the structure, the function and the, the mechanism by which DNA works becomes more apparent. And that's why it was such a big deal. Um, there's a great movie, it's called The Race for the Double Helix or originally released from the BBC under the title Life Story. Um, it stars Jeff Goldblum and it's a dramatization of the race or the research to find the structure of DNA and I think it's quite good. If you have the opportunity to watch it, I highly encourage you to do so. Now, when we talk about the double helix, we talk about it as a right-handed helix. We talk about the terms Watson-Crick base pairing after Watson and Crick. This idea that A's go with T's and G's go with C's. We also call this complementary base pairing. And when those base pairs hold on to each other through hydrogen bonds, it enables us to form the double helix. Now you'll notice, and we'll see a picture of this in just a couple minutes, that A's and T's, or in RNA, A's and U's, have two hydrogen bonds between them while G's and C's have three hydrogen bonds. I want you to know that and it's going to come into play the more we work with DNA because it's going to play a role in how tightly the two strands are held together. The more bonds you have obviously the harder it is to pull those strands apart and that's going to play a role when we start to think about using PCR to identify sections of DNA, to amplify DNA, talk about melting temperature between strands. Now the other thing to notice when we talk about orientation especially is that it's an anti-parallel molecule. That means the two strands run in opposite directions. And we can see that in this um, slide here. So again, now that we know that each end has a 5 prime end and a 3 prime end, you can see here on the right in the partial chemical structure that the strand on the left here starts with the 5 prime end up top and the 3 prime end on the bottom while the opposite strand has the 3 prime end up top and the 5 prime end on the bottom. They run in opposite directions to pair up. 
And that's going to be important because that directionality of the molecule also lends itself to how it functions as an information storing molecule. There's a directionality to reading DNA, just like in English we read from left to right. In DNA, you read 5 prime to 3 prime. And you have to understand how the molecular mechanisms work to take information from DNA to RNA to protein, and the directionality has to be understood, otherwise you'll read things the wrong way and you'll get gibberish. All right, so that's why we're going to come back to this again and again. Um, again, when we look at the base pairs, we can see that A's and T's bond with two hydrogen bonds and G's and C's bond with three. But note that we always, always see a pyrimidine with a purine. All right, so that's the only way to maintain a consistent width of the double helix, and it's consistent with the X-ray data when we explore the structure of DNA on an atomic level. Now, DNA and RNA are both nucleic acids, but they have some differences. They play different roles in the cell, but they're both information molecules. Deoxyribonucleic acid, DNA, ribonucleic acid, RNA. I've mentioned it before, but deoxy means without oxygen. So basically we're saying that deoxyribonucleic acid is a ribonucleic acid without oxygen. DNA is missing a hydroxyl group on the 2' prime carbon. So knowing that, I should be able to show you these two molecules and say which one of these is RNA and which is DNA. And clearly you can see the one on the right is DNA as it's missing that extra oxygen. That's going to play a role in the characteristics of the molecule because without that additional hydroxyl group, the molecule is much, much less reactive. It's much more stable. All right. Now RNA also substitutes thymine um, with a uracil. So we don't see any thymines when we build RNA molecules, we see uracils. So A's bond with U's in RNA in an identical manner as they do with T's in DNA, but G's and C's are consistent. Now DNA comes in more than one form. The form that we're going to talk about all quarter is the physiologically active form, and that's the B form of DNA. There are, other, there are other forms that you will hear about and that you will read about as you go on in your studies. Those are the A form and the Z form, but we're not going to worry about those this quarter. So in this picture, you can see the top most model here is the B form of DNA, and that is the classic double helix. And you'll notice that the sizes of the grooves in that DNA are different. You have a small groove and then a big groove and then a small groove and then a big groove and this is what we call the major and minor grooves. Now these result from the structure of the nucleotide pairs. The structure of the, of the, the sugar has a little kink in it and that turns the ends and so when you stack them up and link them together with that phosphodiester bond you basically get a major groove on one side and a minor groove, a smaller groove on the other. And when you draw DNA accurately, as you have here on the right, you can see the difference in the major and minor grooves. Why is this important? It's important because this molecule, its structure is also its function. Right? So the, if the information is in the sequence of DNA, the sequence of the nucleotides, how do you get that information out? You have to interact with the molecule. And to interact with the molecule to read the sequence, you have to delve into the major and minor groups. So you can pull the DNA apart, which is what we'll do later as we look at the function of DNA. But to interact with the DNA to find out where you are on the molecule, you have to take a protein. It's often a protein. can be other um, nucleic acids, but we're going to focus on proteins um, that insert almost like a hand into the major group to feel the, the molecular patterns there. And so what you'll see in this particular slide is that each base pair, G and C, T and A, A and T, and C and G, each create a unique pattern of hydrogen bonding in the major groove and the minor groove. And if we represent that in a different way with kind of different colored beads between the two um, ladder strands, um, you can see clearly that if you were able to feel these and they felt different, then you have a way to recognize a specific sequence without ever perturbing the molecule itself. So literally you can recognize the code, the sequence of A's, T's, G's, and C's just by interacting with the major and minor grooves of DNA. And that's going to be very, very important as we start to literally scan the DNA for 
um, the starts of genes or the ends of genes or a place to cut the DNA. So we'll come back to this idea later as we move into the function of DNA and how to interact with proteins.